Sunrise and sunset, promise and fulfillment, birth and death. The whole drama of life is written in the sands of time. We present a new series of radio programs, The Clock. Felis Domestica, better known as the common house cat, is rumored to have nine lives, while man is presumed to have but one. Such is the common conception. But there are some who believe otherwise. There are some who say that the present life they live is merely one of a number, and that if you could go back in time, you would find yourself again in another age, perhaps in another form. Well, I don't intend to take sides in the matter, but I was wondering if I could offer anything by way of evidence. A story, perhaps. The tale of one John Shepley, a man whose clock turned backward in a most unconventional way. A man who returned to a life he had lived once before. Sit down, my dear. Relax. I suppose I'm behaving like a child, Dr. Brewster, but I'm frightened. I don't know what I've been through in these last few weeks. Well, suppose you'd tell me about it, Jean. You know, of course, that John and I are soon to be married. I was hoping for the pleasure of attending your wedding. Wedding? I don't know anymore if there'll be a wedding. Why? What's happened? John's ill, Dr. Brewster. Ill? Well, not physically, but... There's something wrong with his mind, I think. It started with a dream. A dream? Yes. He's had that dream every night for the last three weeks. He won't tell me what it is exactly, but... I can see what it's doing to him. It's changing his personality. It's making him behave like someone else. Oh, I see. I love him very much, Dr. Brewster. Up to now, I was sure he loved me. And now? I don't know. I came to you as a last resort. But, uh, I'm not a psychiatrist, Jean. I, I can't interpret these dreams for you. You're his friend, Dr. Brewster. Perhaps the only one he can talk to. And you may be the only one who can save him. Save him? You sound as if, as if his life's in danger. It is, Dr. Brewster. It is. John, what is this thing that Jean fears so much? What's happened between you? Dr. Brewster, I, I'm going to ask you a very odd question. Oh, I'm used to odd questions. Do you believe in reincarnation? Reincarnation? Do you believe man can live more than once? That you and I and Jean once existed before in a, in a different era? Well, first tell me, do you believe in it? Yes, I do. Why? Because I have proof. And what's your proof? For the past three weeks, I've had a dream. A recurrent dream, always exact, down to the tiniest detail. And what's the substance of that dream? The substance, Dr. Brewster, is that I'm a murderer. Uh, <sighs> you, you don't believe me, do you? I don't know what to say. I, I, I tell you, it's the truth. I'm a murderer, Dr. Brewster. It's come back to me again and again, night after night. The dagger. His blood on the chair in the palace. Did you recognize your victim? Yes. Well, who was he? His name was the Normand de Troyes. He was married to the Marquise de Pompadour. Marquise de Pompadour? Good heavens. That woman's been dead for almost 200 years. I know. And she was beautiful. I loved her, Dr. Brewster, and I, I gave my life for her. Oh, I know, I sound like a maniac. Well, maybe I am. Sometimes I wonder myself. And yet I can't get over it, that feeling of having lived during the reign of Louis XV, of having been in love with Madame Pompadour, and of having murdered her husband. John, listen to me. Go to a psychiatrist. I don't need a psychiatrist, Dr. Brewster. I have to work this out for myself in some way. But if you go on like this... Do you know where it might end? For Jean? I, I know. In unhappiness. But I can't help myself. As wretched as I feel about her part in it. And for you, John? Do you know what the ending might be for you? Murder will out, Dr. Brewster. And the only ending for a murderer 
is the hangman's noose. You've only one hope, Jean. You've got to get his mind away from the past. You've got to make him realize he lives in the present, that today is what counts. We used to have such fun together. Now I hardly see him. Try to relive those moments with him. Take him to the theater, the art museums. Do what you used to do. And make him forget about himself. I'll try, Dr. Brewster. I'll try very hard. <laughs> And Jean did try, with all her strength and all her heart. She tried to hold the man she loved to keep him from leaving her forever. And for a while it seemed she might succeed. For a short time, John forgot his dreams and his strange compulsions. Until one day in an art museum, as he and Jean walked slowly through the marble corridors. John, look at this Vermeer. Oh, isn't it exquisite? Yes, it is. He was a great artist, Jean. Everything about his work showed genius. Let's look at the cars. Look at the... What are you smiling at? Nothing. It's just that I'm so happy. You are? These last few weeks have been so different. We've come closer together again. Oh, darling, other John I know and fell in love with. <laughs> now, let's see what's in that room, shall we? Oh, it's only furniture. I'd rather see the rest of the oils. But if you want to see it, darling... Yes, I do. Come into that room with me, Jean, please. It's a French living room. Furniture's antique. Yes. Why, it says here... This room was occupied by... Louis XV. I I've been inside it before, Jean. Here, in the museum? No. What do you mean, John? I remember this furniture when it was new. You what? I'll show you I do. I remember every piece. Every piece. Now, you see that cabinet in the corner? Well... Open it. We're not supposed to touch them. Open it, Jean. It may prove something. If you find a... a dagger inside that cabinet, a bloodstained dagger, I know I'm right. John, please. Open it, Jean. Uh, all right. Oh, you found it. Yes. I put it there. Let's get out of here. No, no, I've got to stay. John, if you love me at all. What are you doing? The blood is still here on the chair. I'll never forget the blood. John, please take me home. Look, Jean, that painting on the wall. Do you know who she is? No. Jean-Antoinette Poisson, Marquise de Pompadour. The most beautiful woman who ever lived. You stare at that picture like... a man in love. I was years ago. Odd, isn't it? Her first name. And yours. But the same, I mean. John! If you don't mind, Gina, I want to stay here alone for a while. With the woman I love. John stood there for a long moment after Jean had gone, staring up at the beautiful portrait. I watched him from my perch above the high French cabinet. Then I spoke. Huh? I said hello. Who are you? Where are you? It isn't necessary for you to see me. We've met before. Have we? At least you think we have. I was around in Louis' time, and I knew the Marquise very well. To know her was to love her. Perhaps. However... Your memory may not be what you think it is. How do you mean? You'd like to return, wouldn't you? You'd like to go back a couple of hundred years. More than anything else in the world. Are you sure you won't regret it? I'll take that chance. It's the only thing that can save me now. I've got to know the truth. What time do you have? Oh, it's ten past four. You're slow by five minutes. Well? I'm going to add two hundred years to that five minutes. I'm going to make that timepiece in your wrist run slow by two centuries. What are you doing? What's happening to me? You're going back, my friend, to the Marquise de Pompadour. And I wish you a pleasant journey. Monsieur Lefebvre, are you in there? 
here. Just a moment. Oh, the door was locked. For a moment, I thought something had happened to you. Who are you? Who am I? What is wrong with you? I'm Charles de Port, secretary to the Marquise. That's who I am. Secretary to the Marquise. The Marquise de Pompadour? Naturally. But then, I must be in Versailles, the palace of Versailles. Perhaps you need a doctor, monsieur. You seemed quite well a few moments ago when I went to inform the Marquise of your arrival. But now... I'm quite all right. <laughs> Just a fainting spell. I, I've had them occasionally. A fainting spell? Hmm. Well, I hope you don't faint when you see the Marquise. She doesn't have too much respect for men who uh, behave like kittens. Just lead me to her, Deport. And see how I behave. Great honor, madame. You may rise, monsieur. That'll be all the poor. Very well, madame. To what do I owe this privilege, madame? To your price as a servant, perhaps? Or to your reputation with the ladies? The ladies, madame? Oh, come now, you can relax with me. I'm a commoner just as you are, by birth. You're also the most beautiful woman I have ever seen in my life. If Louis should hear you, your life would be a short one. It's worth the risk. You're very gallant. It goes well with your reputation. <laughs> My reputation seems to have traveled a great deal farther than I have. I brought you here to offer you an opportunity. I would like you to become my personal bodyguard. Your protector, madame. My protector, defender, and companion. Nothing would please me more. Think well before you answer. My demands may be rather dangerous at times. Danger doesn't worry me. I have enemies. You enemies? Yes. There is one who I'm very much afraid of. And who is that? My husband. Or should I say, my ex-husband. As you know, we were divorced. Le Lomont seemed to feel that my friendship with the king was damaging to his reputation. <laughs> Idiotic, isn't he? Very, madame. However, I'm sure you can handle him. I'm going to ask that you be transferred from the king's guard. I can arrange it. I can arrange practically anything in France. So I've heard. If you hadn't died as you did at the age of 43, France might have become... What? Oh, I... I beg your pardon. That was a silly thing to what say. What on earth are you talking about? I am only 30 now. What is this nonsense about my death at 43? Oh, please forgive me, madame. Do you set yourself up to be a seer? I might surprise you, madame. What kind of a trick are you playing, monsieur? No trick, madame. I... I have hunches, that's all. Hunches? Well, it's, it's purely guesswork. But it, it's not guesswork when I tell you... That I would lay down my life for you. Gladly. Would you? Yes. I'm glad you said that, monsieur. You are, madame. Yes. For I may give you the chance. Monsieur de Port? Well, monsieur? The Marquise has given orders for me to be quartered here in the palace. Oh. I am to have the West Suite. Ah, the West Suite, no less. Oh, she favors you, monsieur. <laughs> Come this way. I presume there's a bath attached. What did you say? A bath. A tub or a shower. I want to have one in my suite. <laughs> but that's ridiculous. It is? But this is only March. March? What, do you mean to say... A little perfume will make you feel better. Perfume? My foot. I want a bath with soap. But baths are not in season now. Did you hear what I said, Deport? Hmm? Whatever you wish, monsieur. It's, uh... Your skin. John. What? Why are you speaking to me, monsieur? Deport can't hear me, John, but you can. Oh, I, I see. I beg your pardon, monsieur. Get rid of Deport, John. I want to talk to you alone. I was thinking of taking a bath. The bath can wait. But whom are you speaking to, monsieur? Why are you looking behind you? There's no one there. Oh, <clears throat> I'll, I'll be with you in just a few minutes, Deport. Wait for me in the next corridor. Oh, very well, sir. The man is the man. Well, John, how do you like it? 
How does it feel to live in the 18th century? It's a fantastic experience. It, it's something I've always wanted to do. You mean you don't want to go back? Never. Not as long as she is alive. You're speaking of Madame de Pompadour. Yes. John, you're making a big mistake. It's my life. I can do what I like with it. See it yourself. I promise I won't ask you again. But I suggest you keep your dream in mind. My dream? You were a murderer in that dream, John. It was a dream you couldn't escape. And the man you believed you murdered was the husband of Madame Pompadour. The man she wants you to guard her against. Well, what about it? Nothing. I was just wondering if history would repeat itself in reverse. I love to ride early in the morning. It makes the blood pour through my veins with new strength. I could ride this way for the rest of my life with you. <laughs> Careful. They say that even the horses are loyal to the king. <laughs> You're so hardened. I love you. I can't keep it to myself any longer. Just one kiss, please. One kiss. And what would you give for one kiss? Anything you ask. Come closer, darling. There, you've had your kiss. And as far as payment is concerned, I intend to exact it shortly. You sent for me, son? The time has come for you to prove yourself. What do you want me to do? My husband, the normal, is trying to blackmail me. Yes? He knows about us, and he intends to tell the king. You've got to stop him. Don't worry about it. I'll handle him. How? I'll give him two days to get out of France. Oh, that won't do. You don't know what it's like, Georges. He hates me. He's even threatened to take my life. And he has agents, men who would murder for a sou. As long as he lives, Georges, I'll have no peace. You've got to kill him tonight. But, but surely there must be another way, Jean. Can it be that you are afraid? You know better than that. I only know that you can't possibly love me if you permit the Lomo to live. You'll never see me again if you do. John. I mean that. Oh, my darling. My darling, you've got to help me. He terrifies me. Please don't fail me now. Where can I find this Lenormo? I have asked him to come to the castle tonight. The king is in Paris. You can deal with him here as you like. Will you do it for me? Let me know when he arrives. Here. Take this ring. It will bring you luck. Do you see this inscription on the inside? Pompadour. Wear it on your finger. Wear it on the hand that holds the sword. As you can see, no matter what period of history, time is always the same. And so are the men and women. He has entered the palace, Monsieur Lefebvre. He'll come through this corridor in a moment or two. He'll have his chance to draw his sword. His sword? Are you crazy? A duel would bring a household down on you. You've got to use his dagger and use it quickly before he can utter a sound. You mean stab him in the back? Yes. But that's murder in cold blood. That's the way it must be done. Mm. You take it. We can wait behind these portieres. As he passes, let him have it. Oh, no, wait. Here he comes. No. No, not this way. I can't. Give me the dagger. With the compliments of the Marquis. <laughs> Quick, before the guards come, take this dagger and hide it in the cabinet. He never had a chance. You... you... <laughs> Quiet! It is her ladyship. What is this? What? Oh! No, 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 speak to me. He's dead, madame. Dead. And his murderer is over there. You're lying to Port. You killed him yourself. Silence. So, this is the way you will pay my trust in you, Monsieur de Favre. Jean, you... How dare you arrest me that way? No, you can't be serious. Keep him under arrest. Monsieur de Favre, I see that you get the guillotine for this. Take him away. <laughs> Good evening, Monsieur Lefebvre. What? Where is the Marquise? Oh, the Marquise is not in the habit of visiting cutthroats in a dungeon. She sent me in her place. 
What is it you wish? Nothing. I shouldn't have asked her to come. I should have known she'd refuse. At dawn, you will die, monsieur. May I uh, offer my apologies? If I could get at your throat! <laughs> <laughs> Save your strength, monsieur. You will need it to climb the guillotine steps. The fact that it was I who killed Lenormand is unimportant. Had you killed him yourself in fair fight, you would still be on your way to your grave. You mean she'd planned it so that I... Naturally. You don't think for one moment that she wanted you around after your job was finished? That she... she was just using me. Lenormand was still her husband. They were never actually divorced. And that was a nuisance to her ladyship, inasmuch as she had other plans. Plans which concerned the king. So that's what really happened. I beg your pardon? And I thought... I thought that I was a murderer. <laughs> but I'm not, you see, I'm not. You have a very peculiar sense of humor, monsieur. You don't understand, you fool. You can't hurt me. I can go back. I can... Well, can I? Is it too late? Is it too late? It is never too late, monsieur, for Madame Guillotine. We are ready, monsieur Lefebvre. Before I give the signal and your head rolls, is there anything you wish to say? Yes. I have a friend somewhere who brought me here. Where are you? I want to go back. You were right. Please take me back. Please take me back. Have you learned your lesson, John? Just give me one more chance, that's all I ask. Just one more chance. Just one more chance. Executioner, do your duty. What? Oh. Was it you, Jean? I had to come back. I couldn't leave you here like this. Jean. You look as though you've been ill. You haven't moved from this spot since I left the museum. Ill? I'm well, Jean. I'm well and I've come back to you. John. I was wrong about everything. <laughs> I'm not a murderer, Jean. Really, I'm not. And I'll never have those dreams again. And what about her? That woman in the portrait up there, the Marquise de Pompadour. The Marquise? She's just as dead, Jean, as my love for her. She's part of the past, that's all. And I'm here in the present with you. There's your story. What's that? The events are not historically correct. I agree with you. According to the history books, it didn't quite happen that way. But then, historians deal with important facts. And you must admit that a mere romance could have been omitted by the textbooks. However, there's just one more thing. I was still there when John and Jean left the museum arm in arm. As he walked out of the room, he accidentally dropped a small metal object on the floor. It was a ring. A large ring that may have been worn by a woman. And there was one word inscribed in the band. That word was Pompadour. The clock will be heard again next week, same time, same station. This program was written by Lawrence Clee and narrated by Hart McGuire as the clock. As John, you heard Charles Tingwell. Others were Coralie Neville, John Bushell, Sheila Sewell, David Butler. The clock, directed by John Saul, is a Grace Gibson radio production. Oh.